Thank you, Tiho. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about this concept that I like to have uh, been working on for a little bit. And uh, kind of in general, the, the way I like to describe it is it's a type class for data of all sizes. Um, so a little bit about me. That's, that's my picture. Um, woo! woo. Uh, <laughs> I am a computer science graduate from CMU. I graduated about a year ago. Uh, total barrier transplant. Grew up in the Midwest. Family is in the Midwest and East Coast. Um, and as Tiho uh, gave me in his lovely introduction, I'm a research engineer at Nitro. Uh, you know, I love working about here is I get to write Scala all day, and I work with people who not only just they love functional programming, but they really get it. Um, and uh, you know, I get to apply that kind of functional programming code. They get to write to different sorts of natural language and machine learning problems. Um, the motivation behind this talk is really about the Scala Collections Library at the heart. Um, I think everybody, uh, raise your hand here if you've written a Scala program or done anything. Good number of people. Uh, so have you ever written a program that didn't use map or flat map or fold or any one of those things? Keep your hand up if you did. Awesome. That's, wow, this is a zero. OK, great. So that, that's, you know, that's a great kind of empirical sort of result, right? Like ask everybody in the audience. Everybody's used, really familiar with these kinds of concepts. Um, and uh, you know, everybody's probably heard that these concepts uh, for manipulating data work really well when you scale up, right? There are, you know, uh, four, I, I found, you know, four different projects that are very high profile that use these sorts of concepts. Um, you know, Spark has its resilient distributed data sets. Uh, Apache Flink has its data set uh, concept. Summingbird and Scalding, which you write, you know, uh, sort of functional code that uses these idioms uh, that can work on, you know, uh, Hadoop and uh, Apache Storm. Um, and then I also have sort of inspired other library designs, like the Aka Streams library. Um, but that implements the reactive streams uh, interface. Um, but you know, unfortunately, there's not really a single API that targets these different systems. Right? You can imagine if you want to write a word count program, you could write it and it would work on RDDs. You could write it and it could work on a, a Flink data set, or it could work on a sequence or a traversable. Um, but you wouldn't be able to get that to work on any one, that one algorithm uh, or code you write to work on everything. You'd have to write a separate implementation where you just change the input parameter uh, type. And that'd be a little kind of, in a sense, it's a little, uh, weird, right? It's like it's doing the same things semantically I would expect it to. Why can't I just write my algorithm once and then just put anything in there that sort of behaves as the way I expect it to behave and keep running? Um, and that's exactly the you know, motivation behind here. If we limit ourselves to sort of a mini batch style processing you know, uh, idea, can we make an expressive uh, data manipulating API that could target these different sorts of platforms? Um, so specifically, I'm just going to kind of limit it to the local Scala collections. Uh, an RDD and the data set from Spark and Flink, respectively. You know, uh, if, if you just really want to get kind of this all in one slide and get a nice visual for it, like what the motivation here, um, you know, it's really uh, having one data API to rule them all. Um, that was me last night coding. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'll end this talk going forward. Uh, we've already kind of covered, you know, what the problem we're solving. Um, but it'd be really quick, kind of just high level the API to sort of just reinforce the things I'm sort of talking about. Spent a good chunk of time on the design decisions and the subtle nuances between inheritance uh, or ad, ad hoc polymorphism. Um, and then, you know, at the end, I'm going to try to show you guys some code so you can kind of uh, satiate your, you know, desire to, to really, you know, know what's going on here. Um, and I hope the demo gods accept my sacrifice that I made, and it goes well. Um, so jumping around along to the high-level API, so we want to come up with a set of actions. You know, there can be methods or functions. We'll determine that later. Um, that are useful for uh, data transformation manipulation. They support concurrent processing. Uh, they're, you know, we want to try to keep this as small as possible um, and try to make them uh, reusable and as general. Um, so in this here, let's just assume here D is some kind of collection type. You know, it could be an RDD, it could be a data set. Um, we want to, you know, some very common methods we might want to have are something like a map, right? If I have a, a collection of Type A, I want to be able to apply a function to every single element and uh, kind of convert it. Uh, so I'm going to do a flat map, although the result I apply might be uh, might have failed. So I want to be able to sort of uh, flatten that out uh, and get a, and get a resulting collection. Uh, for reduce and aggregate, really similar ideas, slightly different, but you know at the end of the day, you want to have some function that you can sort of uh, group all your elements together to get a single result out. Um, and zip is a very you know very useful kind of high level idea. You have two of these sorts of data set collections, and you want to make another one where you take each element and put them together. You know, again, these are things probably everybody in this room is infinitely familiar with. Um, 
you know, and so on. There are a lot of other kind of methods that are actually in the uh, the code that I'll show later, but these are just sort of kind of collecting the high, like these are the sort of, I feel, really important kinds of uh, data manipulation API uh, or methods that you should have. Um, so now moving on to some of the design de uh, decisions here, I'm going to spend some time, uh, probably a, a big chunk of time of this uh, presentation, talking about the difference between subtyping and, uh, or choosing a sub, having a subtype approach or going with a type class approach. Um, so in subtyping, the idea is that you have uh, polymorphism through inheritance. Um, so basically, you know, if you want to have different behavior, uh, what you can do is you can have a child extend some class or be a subtype of that, of that type, and it can either um, kind of hone in on that behavior, maybe specialize it some more, or it could completely override it and have a different sort of implementation. Um, you know, everybody here is familiar with you know traversable uh, is a uh, you know, extends traversable like, and you have things like, like seek, extends seek like, and they all kind of go up in this, the collections API has a big sort of subtyping hierarchy. Um, in contrast, a type class is this concept called ad hoc polymorphism. Um, I like to kind of think of it as uh, the sort of, you know, uh, duck typing from Python, except it's sort of, it's well typed, right? If it quacks like a duck, it's a duck, and it also compile to a duck, right? Um, and another way I think of ad hoc polymorphism is it adds a constraint on its implementing type, saying that this type is this, you know, member of this type class because it, I can demonstrate it has this behavior here. Um, you know, Scala will use uh, implicits to say, you know, I need to have some sort of evidence that this type adheres to this type class, and he'll say, I'll find that implicitly in a, in a search when I'm compiling. Um, some more differences in subtyping, you have a, a concrete container type, right? It's always and uh, if you think of like uh, a list and an array list back to you know Java days, right? An array list is like a very specific kind of list, and it's a concrete container type. Um, it's generic because it's like parametric polymorphism. Its inside type is generic, right? It could be an array list or a list of any kind of type. Um, but in, in a type class, you know both the kind of container type and the inner type are both general. You know you're not really. It's it's a little bit of a different sort of subtle difference, and I want to kind of dive into it, into it with a, a really kind of sort of uh, simple example code here. So let's imagine we have this data type, and we're sort of specking out, writing a little bit of code, and we just have one method map, and we're looking at the difference between a, um, excuse me, a, uh, a subtyping approach on the left and a type class approach on the right. So we have our, on the subtyping, we have a trait, and it, it has a, it's parameterized by the inside type A, and our map function needs to have one generic parameter B because it has a function that is going to convert A into some other type and it's going to you know, pop out a, uh, an instance of data, but where the inside type is t has changed. And in the implementation, let's say you have a class that wraps around a simple traversable. Uh, it'll have to extend data, right? And then when we do map, it's really simple. We just you know, take the inside traversable type, call map on it with F, and wrap it up again as traversable. Um, in contrast, in the type class approach, you notice that uh, it's actually parameterized by uh, D. And there's a little constraint on it saying that D has to be a higher kinded type. Um, basically, I like to think of this kind of as D has to be a donut, right? Like you think of a donut, it's, it's kind of complete, but there's a big hole missing in the center. And if you want to make it you know, a full, well-balanced breakfast, you've got to put a donut hole inside of that, that donut, and now it's a complete sort of type. Um, but uh, so in this case, right, when you implement map, you'll notice that both, it has, uh, both an A and a B are generic, right? Because the very first thing you apply to map is an instance of that container type, right? You're saying I have a container type, I know the container is D, and I know what's inside of that container are things of type A. Now if you give me that, and then you also give me a function from A to B, I'll know how to convert, you know, iterate over that thing or whatever, be able to change every single inside from an A to a B. Um, and let's say if we are implementing that with traversables, right? One thing that's different is we notice that the implementation is an object. It's not a class. We don't need to make a new instance of this thing every single time. We just need one because we just have a method. Um, and notice when we say when we have map down there defined, um, we have that the, the D type has become very concrete right now, right? It's very very specific. It's traversable, um, and we're also returning a traversable type. So we're not really actually, one kind of nice approach to this is we're always dealing with that specific type. It's never going to going back up into um, a type har hierarchy, right? Because that's kind of the, the central idea of a type class, um, is it's a big kind of separation of concerns, is 
in subtyping, right, like we're creating a new type that's going to be a sort of different way to look at the data. It's not a traversable, it's a data of A, right? Or it's not an RDD, it's a data of A. Um, in a type class, we're always, we're keeping that, that collection type the same. We're just having sort of another set of methods around that we know can always work and operate and manipulate that specific type. Um, and it's a subtle difference. And you know, my, my professional opinion is I like the type class uh, approach more because I feel like it's a little more, uh, it's, it's not only is it more transparent, uh, be, but it's, it, it's generic and has no ambiguity. In the, um, I'm going to show a problem in the next slide with subtyping of how um, when you have this type hierarchy, it's kind of opaque and you can run into some weird problems if you're not really careful with it. Um, so leading into that, right, what are some problems with subtyping? Um, well, I kind of was pointing out that I keep going on about, you know, when you return, you return the sort of, I'm calling it an opaque type. Um, we noticed in map, go back here, right, map returns in the, the subtyping approach on the left, it returns a data of B, where on the right in the type class, it returns a specific instance of D. So it's, it's a little bit different, right? It's in the type class, it's a traversable. In the subtyping, it's always a data. So like, you don't really know what the implementation is, you just know it has these methods on it when it's a subtype. Um, and subtyping is nice because it gives you the subtraction over the specific collection. So it's saying, hey, these are some operations you can have that work on it. I don't really care about the implementation. I'm sort of hiding that from you. Um, but I argue that, that the cost of this hiding is bad. Um, and it creates a sort of leak, uh, a leaky abstraction um, because you uh, can do, I'm going to show one thing you can do with, if you're implementing zip, how it can go wrong. You don't really know if you're, what kind of things you're trying to zip. Um, you could be trying to zip you know, a giant uh, um, RDD in memory with a small traversable. And that might make sense, but you have to really kind of think, like, how would you do that sort of operation? Right? When you have, um, in subtyping, when you have instances uh, of, of the same, of, of, a, of a same parent type interact with one another, you can sort of lose sight of how they're supposed to interact. When you use the type uh, class approach, you always have the specific type, and so whenever you're interacting with them, you're always saying, okay, yeah, I have like a very specific instance of something that implements this type class, and you know, they're gonna be the same type. They're generic, but they're gonna be the same type. Um, so let me try to move on here and see if I can make this a little more clear. Um, in uh, the subtyping approach, if you wanted to keep this specific type and not have it, uh, you know, say I want to have a specific type of data um, that I'm returning, right? You'd have to, you always would have to put that type in the, as a caller, you'd have to know the type you're supposed to get. So you have to call map with saying, here's the, the, the type B that's going to be ter the, the inside type that we uh, uh, transforming into, and then Here's some other type D that's a subtype of data, and I'm returning that specific one. Um, and it's kind of ugly, sort of verbose, a uh, little bit unnecessary. You know, in an example, if you had something like that, you'd say, well, D is a specific concrete instance of a traversable data subtype. And when I map over it, I have to give it you know, the inside type I'm changing as well as, OK, make sure you don't kind of promote it to the parent type. Make sure you keep it specific as a traversable of data. Um, you know, or you could take the Scala Collections Library approach. Um, it definitely it works well. Everybody uses it. Um, it's less boilerplate and elegant, but it's kind of complicated. Um, if you notice in the very last line, right, you see it says map B that. Um, so in this case, like that is going to be the specific collection type you're returning. Um, and you can look at this code if you go to like, you know, fire up any IDE, uh, go jump to the dec declaration of traversable, like you'll see in traversable like its parent type, you'll see this, def this exact definition of map. Um, if you look at it and you're not really familiar with what's going on, like it, it's very weird, right? Like map returns that, like I thought it returned a traversable, you know, okay, well this is can build from, what's, what's repr be that, oh, that's parameterized there. Like it, it becomes very kind of hard to figure out like what is that type here, right? What, well, like what's going on? Um, it's because, you know, I kind of feel subtyping can be very complicated to follow, right? Here is the uh, uh, actual, wow, this dude is loud. Uh, here's the actual, you know, type of, uh, uh, type kind of definition of, uh, definition of a traversable. And I also decided to pull in traversable like so you could see that repr, um, right? So it's this crazy hierarchy. Traversable is traversable like and it's gen traversable and it's traversable once and it's also generic traversable template. And a traversable like is an any that also is a has 
oh, sorry, is also a has new builder. It's also a filter monadic. It's also traversable one, once. Like this is, this is getting like really kind of crazy. I mean, it's a testament that the Scala the collections library works really well. It's very you know rich and expressive. Um, but if you're trying to kind of rebuild this yourself, it would be a major undertaking. Um, and still, this approach, you still have to parameterize um, the return type in this approach, right? Instead of putting in the method, we're now putting it into the trait, right? So like repr here is the type of a traversable. If you look in the very top where it says uh, traversable of A, right here, right? It's in that case, right, traversable is saying it extends traversable like with A and repr is traversable of A. Um, so you can't really get around the idea that if you want to have a specific return type, you have to uh, be able to account for it when you're calling it, at least in some way, shape, or form. Um, so if we're going to kind of, let's drill down a little bit on zip. Everybody's here familiar with zip, right? Um, in the subtyping approach, you have your data are, is you, right? So it's, it's inside of the, sort of in the, the closure or in scope of zip. Um, so you're zipping you know, yourself with that, and you're going to come out with a, uh, a, 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 a super type, right? Like the parent type of data where you have the tuples A and B. Um, in the type class approach, you are uh, zipping two things, A and B, that are each a specific instance of the type D that obeys the type class. And you're going to come out with another uh, collection, D collection, same D collection. It's not this very specific one. It's not a super type. It's that one where you have the tuples A and B. Um, so here's the problem in the subtyping case. The type system allows us to evaluate to any very specific implementation of data, right? So if let's say this is the zip that's defined on the child that implements this sort of data type for an RDD, um, it could be returning, and we're trying to zip it with another data. We don't know what kind of data that is. Um, we don't know if that's a traversable. We don't know if that's another RDD. Um, we also don't know if that's like another Flink data set instance, right? So we would have to do some sort of runtime type checking to sort of figure out how we can uh, do the zip. Um, and also, you have to, that also kind of gets this sort of weird logic. You have to say, like, well, what does it mean to zip between two sort of instance types that are, that are different? Um, and the type class type, like this, this doesn't exist, right? We're returning and always using this very specific type D. So you never have to even make this kind of consideration of, well, how do you zip two Ds together? I mean, it's sort of like this is supposed to be the definition. Um, and you're never going to get a case where you could have maybe some weird logic coming in because you're trying to zip two different instances that they are both obey a type class, but they're different types. Um, so I'm going to declare success here. I'm going to say that. Type class is one, you know, subtyping is zero. Um, they, uh, in type classes, they provide a way to abstract over a collection as well as the inner type. Um, and uh, I believe, you know, type classes uh, make us make sure that we're as safe, type safe as possible. Um, our implementations work with a spe single specific collection type. Um, and we're never going to be mingling or messing up our different implementations of the type class and trying to, you know, having problems with that. Um, and type classes are nice because you can use them to retrofit existing classes without changing their code. Um, and you can also ex easily extend them and use them for new types in the future. Um, so now I'm going to go into some of the code. And uh, I hope the demo works here. I think it will. But um, one thing I wanted to point out is this is actually something I got at the Scala by the Bay conference. Um, there was this excellent presentation on the uh, uh, sil sil I'm going to mess this up, simulacrum. Uh, it has this, this macro, this annotation called type class. Um, and what it does is, is it does a lot of uh, uh, compile time code generation that generates infix notation for a type class. So instead of having to say at the top here, I say, you know, if I have a method uh, and I have, you know, the, 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 the bound that D is a type data is like obeys the data type class, then if I want to use it, I have to say, well, implicitly, you know, find me that data instance for D and then um, get its map method, and then apply it to data, and then apply the resulting function uh, f to that. You know, a little bit more verbose than just saying data.mapf. Like, that's kind of the, that's one of the nice things is sort of the object-oriented infix approach. It's really nice. Um, and if you want to do it yourself, you can. It's just you have to generate all that by hand. It's boilerplate. Nobody likes boilerplate. This is a 
uh, you know, one annotation you can put on it, it generates all the infix notation for you. It's really great. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go to some of the code here. Um, I realize I got it's about 20 minutes already, so not going to be too long. Um, but I wanted to show you guys what this uh, data type class looks like here. Is this working? Okay. And I'll zoom in. So the so you see here, this is this stuff actually compiles and has tests. It's like 80% code coverage or whatever, pretty close to that. Um, so you can see here at the, the top right, we have that annotation type class. It's a trait uh, data. And we're saying here's our, our D is a higher kind of type. Um, and we have a lot of methods here to find like map, uh, map partition. Because one of the things we want to use is, is sometimes we know it's maybe more efficient to do something kind of uh, to, act, to do a kind of map-like operation, but on a single partition of them before we send it off. Um, that's sort of one of the design constraints with, well, we want to make this kind of work well with uh, distributed data processing systems. And map partition is one of those things that doesn't exist in the Scala collections, but it's, it's quite nice if you're doing any kind of large data manipulation. Um, we also have some of the impure, you know, the devil functions for each return a unit. It couldn't be used for anything. Sometimes they're useful, um, and they're sort of nice to have around. You have your filter, your aggregate, sort by, uh, take. Uh, you know, this is only like maybe like 10 or uh, like 20 or so methods. Um, but really, we've kind of been using them in house for a while. And we find that it, it's, um, you can do a lot with these, right? It's a very sort of expressive um, but small uh, set of, of actions you can use to apply to your data. And it's really great to just start thinking in these ways of when you manipulate data. Uh, not only is it type safe, but it kind of, uh, you sort of just start thinking in terms of fold um, and reduce and group buys, um, and it's, it gives you a lot of mileage. Um, so here is the, I'm going to show, here we're going to show next. Okay. So this is, right, I was kind of showing this earlier. This is an example of an implementation of this type class for the traversable type in Scala, right? And you can kind of see the implementation here is, is like very kind of straightforward. Like, how do you do map? Well, you we say data.map. How do you do map partition? Well, you have a function that, that goes from an iterable of A to an iterable of B. Basically, just apply that whole function on the, the traversable, uh, and you make sure you keep return traversal, traversable type out. Um, nothing here for the traversable type. Everything here is basically the kind of one lines. Uh, don't worry about that, that, uh, that little guy. I wouldn't worry about that little guy. He's OK. Um, there's this, one, of the, one of the things with the traverse, this kind of approach is that um, when you have different kinds of inner collection types, like a sequence or an index sequence or an array, um, the type class approach will, will need to say, like, hey, uh, I need to know how to, ter to turn in a, I, I need to know how to manipulate an array. Um, so you need to do, need to have, like, some specific type class implementations for some of these, like, very specific uh, Scala collections types. I'm actually, there's currently a work in progress to see how we can kind of, uh, make that problem kind of go away and just sort of say, like, well, we can kind of always promote types to traversable in the collections library and operate on them. Um, not totally ready yet, but we're working on it. Uh, for the uh, RDD, it's a similar case. Like, these things are very kind of implementations, very straightforward. Like, map partition is just map partitions. They have partitions for map, and for each is for each. So I decided to get rid of the S on that. Um, nothing here is kind of too crazy. Um, and even the Flink implementation is really not crazy at all. Uh, the only kind of crazy thing is that Flink decided to, the Flink project decided to define this thing called type information for trying to like understand, to deal with the, the runtime erasure problem um, so it can do stuff like serialization uh, instead of using like a class tag, which is what uh, Spark uses. So it's kind of weird because I figured out a way you can always generate type information from class tags. So I don't know why they're using that. but. There's some other things in here, like you have to say, uh, basically for like the map, right, the B type in uh, a Flink data set, this is the Flink API here, right, your output function R needs to not only know that it has a class tag, but a type information thing here. So that's why here we're making this a little implicit, like we have this little helper that figures out how to generate type info for a B, given that you only have a class tag for B. Um, and these implementations are, are a little bit more complicated. I think Flink is, uh, doesn't have the, the breadth of methods that uh, RDDs have. So things like aggregate, for example, Flink only lets you do aggregate uh, 
on a field. It's, a, it's kind of a weird sort of uh, definition of aggregate. So you can, you, know, you can get through that by saying you can do basically the same thing, uh, partitions, and you can reduce over them. Um, and also their, their reduce is kind of weird. It, instead of returning a single value, it returns a data set of values. Um, again, I think it's just the API has a little bit longer to go. Um, there's some problems with this, right? Like, uh, Flink doesn't implement a total sort, and implements a partial sort, so that's one of the things, open things is implementing a total sort, sort for Flink that can work in this kind of a very easy sort of sort by a method to call. Um, also, Flink as of 0 0.9 doesn't have zip or zip with index, but 0 0.10 does, and that's out, but it's not in Maven, so this code doesn't have zip and zip with index implemented. Um, okay here, so I'm probably coming up at the edge of time here, but what I want to show one thing is a um, implementation here. Probably a lot of people, is anybody here familiar with the idea of like word count for stuff? Show of hands. How many people here have heard of term frequency inverse document frequency? Okay, so that's a, it's a heuristic, not mathematically motivated, but it's a way, um, usually can kind of give you a better word count is a good way to think of it. Um, so it's kind of a, a proof I wanted to sort of show that all this stuff works. Um, I decided to uh, implement a really kind of simple uh, kind of TF-IDF-based word count uh, program here. That sort of the objective is, well, I'll show you. The objective here is if you have, you know, couple of uh, text files in a directory, and you go through them, and you just get all the words out of them, um, where you keep a sort of unique index for each file as a sort of ID, because you're going to treat the whole file as a document, right? Let's just go through them and print the top 25 words according to a TF-IDF weighted um, uh, uh, kind of word count. Um, and so I did this, right? I actually implemented this in terms of this kind of data type class. Uh, Right, so this is something here that the definition here, this is why this kind of type class is really nice and important, um, is that this is a word count here, and then there's term frequency, inverse document frequency, other methods here. They're not defined in terms of an RDD. They're not defined in terms of a traversable. They're defined in terms of something that implements this type class, right? So that means I can apply it, take the same code, right? This is a very simple word counting code. Um, this thing kind of takes something that could be a map and sort of just Turns it, kind of reduces it and turns it into a map. It's a helper function. But the idea is right that I could run this on a huge data set, or I could run this on a couple of files on my laptop. Exact same code, uh, write once, run many places. Um, and I sort of kind of, I know this is not going to be as satisfying to really kind of read and see all this stuff. But um, and there's also weird stuff with like macros and IntelliJ, like not being able to figure out. Uh, stuff about them, so you see some kind of red lines, but everything actually does compile and work. Um, but right, like this is an inverse uh, or term frequency, right? I do a word count, and then I can get all the total counts, um, and then I can have a function that if you give me a word, I'll, I'll figure out its word count, its proportion of its count of word divided by everybody else, or just zero. Um, similar idea for IDF, and then term frequency, inverse document frequency is just boils down to the nice multiplication. Um, and uh, so let's run this here. So I have some, let's show what this kind of data looks like. Um, I got, these are some news articles I pulled off of Google News like a couple of weeks ago. They're a little, they're old, but um, right, if we shoo. So these are just, uh, here's one, you know, Milwaukee, like based on, I think it's like AP here, a story about Milwaukee. Uh, despite his travels through a, throughout a six year old major league career, blah, 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 right? Next story, uh, day after police killed two gunmen who tried to ambush Garland, who tried to ambush a Garland, Texas event, right? So these are just kind of normal newswire articles you'd read anywhere. Um, and we're gonna run this, we we'll see out of these small articles, right, what are the top words according to a TF-IDF weighting, the top 25 words? That was pretty quick, oh, there you go. Um, and it's kind of interesting, right? We see um, that uh, Milwaukee kind of comes up twice in the top 25, which is a little weird, it's probably because it's not a really big data set. Um, but this is something, right, very, very simple program, kind of a toy program, you wouldn't really use it in and of itself. Um, but just sort of explaining the ideas of that, here's a TF-IDF weighting 
um, and like top word grabbing algorithm that you could run on many different kinds of collections. Um, and I hope that you guys, uh, you know, at least see the idea, see it as a powerful idea, and can kind of can take something away from it. Um, and uh, that's that's everything. Um, so this, this code's not totally ready for production or, or even public consumption. Um, there's still some other things you got to work out, but this URL, and I can distribute the slides later, has all the code I used in this talk. So if you guys, that'll compile and you can work and, and play with it. Um, it's Apache licensed. Uh, we just have to do some housekeeping to make it a little bit easier for people to consume, like put it on Sonatype, separate stuff out so you could, you know, pull on the Spark dependencies without pulling in Flink, um, that kind of stuff. And we'll announce it on these two different Twitter handles uh, once it's all ready. Uh, thank you guys for listening. You're being a great audience. Uh, do you guys have any? Yeah, questions? Uh, yeah? Uh, I guess what, what, what would you, so example, yeah, yeah, like what's the specific thing? Yeah, yeah. Some of your functions belong to, it's a belongs to one and other belongs to the reversible and mm. so on. I'll just, instead of putting all these functions together like this, I would just say put, put together the type classes that exist, uh, modularize a little bit more, so would that be compatible with your approach? Um, that is actually something I totally thought of doing. Um, and uh, that's, I think, one of the reasons why this is not ready for public consumption, because that's an approach I want to like take and see if we can, you know, have this data type class as kind of being expressed by uh, these other sorts of type classes, because that would be nice uh, if you could do that originally. Um, I got to be, you know, we got to be honest. I don't have a lot of experience with Scala Z, um, so I didn't really poke around in it when I was kind of doing this. Um, you know, purely, purely knowledge gap. But yeah, it's a great question. Uh, any others? Oh, yeah, that's just like a weird, so the runtime erasure of the JVM, right? If you have a list of A, when you compile your Scala code, when you actually run it, you'll just see it's a list. You don't know what that A type is. So there's, like, every, everybody has a different way, it seems, to, like, solve the same problem. Like, Scala has class tags and also has manifests. And then uh, there's another thing, and, and that's, like, just 2.11 specific. Um, and Spark, the Spark project uses class tags and be able to order, say, I'm going to save, like, save this object along with when I do it. So when I do a map and I send this data off to a node in my cluster and I look at this, I can figure out, like, what's that A type, right? Because that's just going to be erased. It's just going to be, you know, you can do a map. It's just going to say, I have a function one. It's not going to say I have a function one from A to B. So that's, that's the problem that a like, class tag tries to help you solve. Um, and I was just, just kind of going off in the Flink project. It has a similar idea called typed information, but it requires both. And uh, I just wanted to point, that's one of the kind of the pitfalls of sort of when you integrate with some of these different projects, right? Like the idea is you just want a nice map function definition, but you might have to litter it with some class tags and stuff in order to kind of make your life a little easier and just kind of work, have some interoperability between these different libraries. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it seems that you, that's why you won't be able to use kind of uh, uh, yeah, uh, I see, I see. You know, yeah, yeah, and it's probably the scholars that people want to keep it pure. And I, I get that, right? It's just, that's probably, that's probably, I haven't looked into it, that's probably the answer to your question. Um, I'm getting pulled off the stage here. Thank you guys very much. Well,